Hello, ladies and gentlemen. If you could put your phones on silent, that would be really appreciated, if you haven't done so already. So thank you very much to the catering staff. That was uh, a lovely um, start to our evening. So welcome to the Butterfly Conservation SA November public talk. As you can see, this is a special venue to finish our 2021 public talks program. And it's great to be here in the South Australian Museum celebrating this institution's 165th birthday. We thank our guest speaker, Peter McQuillan, for travelling from Tasmania to be with us tonight and tomorrow at our Butterfly Conservation Workshop with Green Adelaide and other stakeholders. Before I welcome Mr Brian Oldman, our host for tonight, who will welcome Peter, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Ghana people and we pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and note that they did not cede this land. We'd also like to acknowledge our life member, Jan Forrest, OAM, who is with us tonight, and Roger Grund, who cannot attend due to ill health. In addition, we'd like to thank the staff from the museum, our AV contractors, Equipe Vision and Sound, and our volunteer webmaster, Lionel Edwards, for their efforts in delivering tonight's event. This event has been made possible by you, the interested public, and members of Butterfly Conservation SA, and our supporting sponsor, Andreas Alexandru from All Property Repairs. Andreas is a very valued member and has provided significant support and promotion over of the Butterfly Conservation SA over the last few years. Thank you, Andreas. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Brian Oldman to the stage to welcome you and introduce Dr. Peter McQuillan. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, just to echo Jerry's words, I also, before I say much in public, uh, always acknowledge that the land that the museum is on is, is the land of the Ghana people. Uh, always was, always has been. Um, they've been around here for at least 50,000 years and I acknowledge their very close affinity to their country and uh, recognise their elders on the past, present and emerging. And uh, so I'm Brian Oldman, Director of the Museum. Very warm welcome from me to you. Good to see you. Some familiar faces in, in the audience. So great to have you here at the South Australian Museum this evening and it looks like you've got a great day ahead of you tomorrow. Um, so just a few words about the museum and, and, its, and its, its research and its collection. So the museum makes a very substantial contribution to our understanding of biological diversity each year through the discovery and documentation of new species, uh, resolving the branches of the tree of life. Um, we're getting there and by providing species identification tools and services. In support of our activities, the museum's 12 researchers have been outstandingly successful in attaining 11 new grants in the year 2020-21 al alone. The museum's biological, geological and humanities research is currently supported by 27 grants, and that includes 14 grants, won from the highly competitive National Australian Research Council and the Australian Biological Resources Study Research Grant Schemes. So in total, the amount of grant research funding that was, that was available to the museum through 2020 and 2021 was just under $3 million, $2,909,000, which is astounding. And the South Australian Museum is, is quite, by some distance, um, the most research intensive museum in Australia. And we are the envy of other museums in, in this country. So museum researchers are also highly collaborative. You can do so much more working with other people than you ever can on your own. And in the last year, our staff have formed collaborations with researchers from 121 different institutions. That's both nationally and internationally. 
And also our staff make a considerable contribution to training the next generation of researchers as they supervised around 40 research students. That's either in, in, in secondary degrees, PhDs. And the museum published 26 taxonomic papers in 2021 describing new living or fossil species and refining biological classifications. Um, and a highlight, one of the many, uh, it included a new species of hip pocket frog. Hip pocket frog. Had to rehearse that one. Uh, from a single mountain top in northern New South Wales. It's only the second species of frog that's been found where the male raises the young in pouches along the sides of their body. Uh, how's that for a bit of role reversal, ladies? Um, we also produce new classifications for such iconic Australian animals as the goannas and pythons, groups of our fauna that are unfortunately favourite subjects in the illegal wildlife trade, which of course we totally oppose. And the museum has also con contributed to documenting and un understanding Lepidopteran biodiversities. Two researchers associated with our entomology group, Mike Moore and Ethan Beaver, along with our own senior researcher, Mark Stevens, have made some significant contributions by describing several new species of moth. A recent highlight is the naming of two species of ghost moths that are endemic to Kangaroo Island. The entire known range of one of these was sadly burnt uh, by the extremely hot bushfires in the summer of 2019 and 20. And to what extent this and several other species, mostly known to only inhabit the bushfire zone, whether they have survived that fire, it's still not known. So the immense task of discovering and documenting our native fauna is daunting, but it's just the beginning of, un of understanding their biology, ecology and life history and the traits that we'll see some survive in the impending rapid environmental shifts of the next century. And I think it's very uh, telling that we're uh, mentioning that in the week of, the, of the, the summit in Glasgow. And let's hope there's some real proper decisions made this week and ones actually that people will stick to. The museum collections and the research they promote play an increasingly important role in biodiversity management, one which we continue to expand not only through traditional research avenues, but now through the increasingly important agency of citizen science. Um, only recently, the Inspiring Australia Insect Investigator Project uh, received a major grant of over $400,000. Uh, in which schools in Western Australia, South Australia and Queensland trap insects and participate in the discovery and naming of new species is an outstanding example and we look forward to more opportunities of this nature. It's getting, it's getting the people involved uh, across the country, involved in science and getting them much closer to nature, which can only be a good thing. But that's enough of the museum. Let's go on to even, even more interesting things. Let's talk about Dr. Peter McQuillan. Um, so Peter is, a, is an, Adelaide, uh, an Adelaide boy and was a regular visitor to the South Australian Museum entomology section from a young age. In fact, he was telling me how even when he was a, a little boy, he got access to the collections. He was always passionate about insects, including micro moths. And I can't think of a better start in life as a, a young boy than coming to the South Australian Museum and playing with the insect collection. So after graduating in agricultural science from the University of Adelaide, he followed a career of entomology in Tasmania and until recently was senior lecturer in geography and environmental studies at the University of Tasmania, teaching biogeography and environmental studies. Peter's research interests include pollination and herbivory, invasive species management and the distribution of insects. He is especially interested in invertebrates as indicators of environmental change. His studies have involved moths, beetles and ants and has made a substantial contribution to the conservation and systematics of Lepidoptera and Coleoptera. He is a strong advocate for the conservation of invertebrate communities and their function. And in 2019, he was senior author of the BCSA produced book, Caterpillars, Moths and Their Plants of Southern Australia. And I'm delighted to say that Peter's topic tonight is why nectar is important to butterflies and where they find it. So I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Peter McQuillan. Welcome, Peter. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks very much indeed, Brian, for those kind words. 
And thanks to Jerry and Jan and other members of BCSA who have hosted me here uh, this week. It's been fantastic. I've even done a bit of field work yesterday down at Hallow Cove in the rain. Um, so this topic might not be necessarily an obvious one, but uh, when you think about it, a great deal is known about the connection between uh, butterflies and plants through their caterpillars. So for almost the entire Australian butterfly fauna, we know what the caterpillars feed upon. And there's a wide range of species of plants that are particular for each butterfly species. But um, while everyone's familiar with the fact that butterflies go to flowers for nectar, no one's really asked the question, do they choose flowers at random or is any flower suitable or do certain butterflies have particular favourite flowers? So um, I'm sure that's probably never entered your mind, but it did mine last year when I, had, I did several, sex, uh, several times of lockdown at home. And uh, to entertain myself, I went looking for pictures of butterflies at flowers that are available on the internet, on things like iNaturalist and Flickr. And I just began to organise the pictures into see if any patterns emerged. So 4,000 pictures later, I had a bit of an idea of what sorts of flowers certain butterflies go to. And in fact, they, they are a bit choosy, choosier than you might expect. So with this talk, I was going to just uh, start with a little bit of background about, um, about butterflies and um, their association with plants, um, and then talk about how they find their food supply, um, what particular things do they feed upon, what flowers are preferred, and uh, then we'll talk about conserving nectar resources because, um, again, this is often neglected, the fact that butterflies need nectar resources and uh, these are often not conserved to the same extent that the food plants of the caterpillars are. So, so why do they feed? Well, we know from evidence and experiments that uh, if they eat, they live longer, they um, fly further, and they lay more eggs. So if a butterfly can't find a nectar source, it can still survive for a few days and behave and reproduce. But if you give it food, it will live, live longer and lay more eggs. But we know that many moths and butterflies don't feed at all because they don't have functional mouth parts. So for example, the ghost moths um, don't have functional mouth parts, although they evolved from ancestors that did. So you can get these reversals where you might have a, a useful thing like a proboscis, but it can be lost over evolutionary time. So those species used to have large caterpillars that lay down a lot of body fat, and the moth stage or the butterfly stage persists on that stored energy. Um, but what's interesting is that the earliest Lepidoptera um, didn't have a proboscis or a sucking tube. They, they had mandibles, so they evolved from other insects with true mandibles. And in fact, um, the Lepidoptera, along with the beetles, the Coleoptera, are the two megadiverse groups of insects that interact with plants, um, and so they're mutually dependent. So here's a picture of the, of the apparatus that they use to feed. So on the left, there's a picture of a, one of the ancient moths that uh, were around in the Carboniferous and Jurassic. Um, and um, you can see in that red circle in the arrow, that's the mandible. It's, it's very small, but they use that to feed on things like the spores of ferns. So these moths evolved before flowering plants. So there was no pollen, there was no nectar, but there was spores on pine trees and ferns. And these were quite a diverse group, but they disappeared and they were largely displaced. But a few still survive, and Australia's got a few remnant species of these mandibulate moths, including one in Tasmania. The, the centre of diversity in the world at the moment is New Caledonia. There's, there's about 50 species of these weird ancient moths living on the ferns of New Caledonia. On the right-hand side is a conventional butterfly and moth, so you can see the coiled proboscis, which is a, one of those extraordinary evolutionary innovations that evolved once and was so successful that it uh, left behind many thousands of ancestral species to this day because it allows butterflies and moths to tap into a food resource that no other insects can efficiently exploit. Um, and the mandibles are completely lost in modern species, but... Um, there's a little feature called the galia, labelled GA, which is present as a tiny uh, little organ in the old mandibulate moths, but it's been modified into the coiled proboscis in modern species. Um, here's a picture of these mandibulate moths, some of the living species. They're very small, about five millimetres, 
They're beautifully metallic. They fly only in daylight. And um, on the right-hand side, there's some recent work by George Gibbs, who's the world authority on this group, and he's identified a, a clade or a group of related species that are within Australia, mainly tropical Queensland and Tasmania, one or two other places. So pretty much most of the species now are thought to have been discovered in this group globally. If you look at the fossil record of butterflies, um, butterflies don't fossilise very well. They're rather delicate and soft, and you know the chance of a butterfly being fossilised is pretty small. But they, it does happen. So often on very fine lake sediments, you know, a butterfly will die and be buried and fossilised. So these are hugely valuable. A, a butterfly fossil is worth about thirty thousand um, dollars if you find one. Um, not quite as much as a dinosaur, but almost. But in some of these, you can still see the we well, can see the proboscis. So some of these are from the tertiary; they're tens of millions of years old, and uh, the proboscis is well and truly present in these fossil butterflies. Um, so here's a close-up. The proboscis is a fairly complex uh, organ. So it um, it's um, made up of two halves that, that fuse together, and they between the fusion is, is a hollow tube. In the bottom right picture, you can see the hollow tube in the centre, and the two sides of the elongated galia are stitched together to function as a whole. And it has a particular musculature that allows it to be extended, uh, partly by hydrostatic pressure, and the elasticity helps it to recoil. So it's, the mechanics of the proboscis are quite interesting in their own right. And there's a sucking um, apparatus a pump at the base of the proboscis that actually sucks up the fluid. And a butterfly can take up about a third of its body weight in, in fluid at a sitting, if, if it has to. So they're quite efficient feeders. So how do butterflies find their food source? Well, they have wonderful colour vision. Not all insects have colour vision. Uh, some have fairly rudimentary colour vision. But butterflies have better colour vision than humans. In fact, better than most birds. Some butterflies have, have uh, 14 channels that are tuned to different colours. They can see into the infrared and ultraviolet. So they see patterns in colours of flowers that we don't appreciate. If you look at some flowers un under ultraviolet light, they've actually got patterns on them. But to humans, they look plain. Um, and different butterfly groups are tuned to different colour spectra. So Swallowtail butterflies see well into the red end of the spectrum, and they'll, they'll go to red flowers, but um, um, others like the nymphalids prefer white, yellow flowers at, at that end of the spectrum. In contrast, um, nocturnal moths, because they're flying at night and don't see much colour, are attracted to scent. So those flowers like jasmine, which releases a very sweet scent in the evenings, that they're pollinated by moths. Um, that's mainly a tropical phenomenon, although there are some temperate area moths, including some in South Australia, like Stackhousia, um, releases a scent in the evenings. And, but you find that most Lepidoptera use a combination of scent um, and, and colour vision to orient themselves to food sources such as flowers. And butterflies are known to be flexible feeders. They can learn. <coughs> so you can actually teach a butterfly, if you want to, to go to a particular colour to associate food with a particular colour in the laboratory. But if you think of things like monarch butterflies, which turn up, you know, 140 years ago, the flower flora is completely different to North America. So they have to learn what flowers have nectar and which don't. And they do this by trial and error. Um, so they've, they've got flexible learning. Uh, this is a horrible slide, I'm sorry, but just, uh, this is a work that just came out recently. People have looked at the um, range of colours in the spectrum that different insects can see. So down the left-hand side are all the main insect orders, and you can see from the, the colours there, that's the part of the spectrum um, in, the, in the rainbow spectrum that they can actually see. So you can see some insects see hardly any colour at all, but a few of them go into the yellow and red end. And that's mainly bees and butterflies, moths. So bees are the other great group of insects that are attracted to flowers and, um, and take nectar. In fact, it's, there's a body of thought that actually says that butterflies evolved just after bees, and they actually are parasites 
of that association between bees and flowers. So bees are highly tuned to uh, flower colour, shape, scent, and of course they're highly motivated to get nectar. They're, they're hairy, they trap pollen, um, and uh, you get these one-to-one -one associations between certain bee species, for example, where there's 3,000 bee species in Australia, mostly solitary, um, which, which serve as our remarkable flora. But then one theory is that butterflies superimpose themselves on this association with that very fine proboscis. They can reach into the nectaries and, and extract the nectar without touching the reproductive parts of the plant. So some of them don't get pollen or transfer pollen. But, but clearly some do. It's not, that's not entirely the case, but it's a popular theory that's being tested at the moment. You know, are butterflies parasites of the, the bee flower association? And you can see in the, the bottom right-hand side there some different lepidoptera groups, some moths and some butterflies. You can see even within that group there's, there's variation amongst different groups. Um, so evolution's sort of fine-tuned this association very much. So foraging is an expensive process for insects. They have to expend energy and time and expose themselves to predators, so they, they have to be motivated to forage. So evolutionarily, the, the pressure's on to forage efficiently, and hence they use colour and scent and shape and those things to you know, uh, make it a much more efficient process. So things like the length of the tongue, um, the size of the body, uh, what's called the, the wing loading, <clears throat> all of these things affect the efficiency of foraging. So some butterflies like skippers have thick, robust bodies that are very muscular, rather short, blunt wings that, are beat, that beat very fast. These, these have a high wing loading. And these um, require a lot of energy. They're like little hummingbirds, so they have to feed regularly, get a lot of nectar, to be able to move around. Other butterflies like the blues, the Lysenids, and some swallowtails have broad sort of floppy wings with, with a low wing loading and uh, they need less energy sort of per kilometre as it were. And so you get some partitioning amongst flowers that suit certain sorts of insects and butterflies compared to others. So if we look at this plant pollinator symbiosis, Again, this evolved a long time ago, you know, back in um, what, 160, 180 million years ago. So before that, there were gymnosperms like pine trees and ferns, you know, non-flowering plants. Once that innovation of flowering came through, it, it exploded into the diversification of angiosperms we see today, and hence the recruitment of insects and hummingbirds and honey eaters to transfer the pollen uh, between individuals. So hence. The argument is that all the wonderful colours and shapes and things that humans enjoy um, in, in flowers and gardens, of course, is a direct result of this, um, this co-evolution between the pollinators and the plants themselves. But, of course, gardeners have superimposed themselves as, as the selective agents, so we get ridiculous, large, colourful flowers that we have to pollinate ourselves or uh, clone them uh, for garden use. And yet, then you get the problem, like in Australia, where you get honeybees and in Tasmania, bumblebees have become introduced. And so honeybees are, are super abundant in Australia and they interfere with this connection between the native insects and the flowers. So the question is, you know, um, if honeybees weren't already here, would we allow them to be introduced? And the answer is probably no. Also, they're the most dangerous animal in Australia. More people die of bee stings than crocodiles and snakes. So you, you couldn't, you'd struggle to make a case to introduce bee, honeybees into Australia in the 21st century. But they're here, and we're not getting rid of them. But they do interfere. They, they draw down the nectar to the disadvantage of the native butterflies and moths. Um, they affect seed set. They move the genetic material much bigger distances between plants, so they tend to flatten the, the genetic geography of, um, of, of uh, native species. But as I say, they're, they're, they're here to stay. Um, so the rewards that flowers offer are things like nectar, um, particularly sugars, uh, water itself is important in Australia, amino acids, um, sometimes edible pollen and oils. Um, and the rewards are you know, very much tuned to the demands of particular uh, pollinators, to the exclusion often of others. Although Australia, is, again, is interesting. If you go to most temperate countries like Europe, temperate America, temperate South America, 
the, dom the dominant canopy trees in the forest are wind pollinated. You come to Australia, the dominant canopy trees are eucalyptus, which are insect pollinated. So, um, you know, in Europe you have uh, well, lots of conifers for a start, you know, willows, birch, all those sorts of trees, they're all wind pollinated. So the canopies are not buzzing with insects to the extent that the canopies in Australia are. Um, and of course, honeybees love it. <laughs> it's all out nice honey. But Australia is a very strange place in that regard. Now, people have looked at this, uh, inter th this connection between certain animals and certain plants and try to classify the pollina pollination types. So eucalyptus would be an example of what you might call a promiscuous plant. So it produces lots of nectar, lots of nice white open flowers that are available to anyone going past. Okay, so they use almost anything going past as a potential agent to move its pollen around. At the other extreme, you've got plants that are, um, through their morphology and um, nectar types, only suit one type of insect. So in this example here, you've got this bird-winged butterfly in your guinea and a plant there which has got a very narrow corolla tube right down to the nectary. So bee, it's too narrow for bees to make their way down that tube. You need a proboscis to, to, to suck the nectar out through a straw. But notice the bright red colour is the very showy flower. And the butterfly can hover, uh, although it grapples the flower with its legs a bit, but there's, although it's a simple photograph, there's a lot going on in that photograph, you know, a lot of co-evolution over many millions of years, apart from the fact that they're very attractive butterflies. Um, pollination ecologists term this connection between butterflies and plants psychophily, for reasons I don't know, but um, it's um, been found that only about 2% of the plants of the world are pollinated by butterflies. So butterflies are not that important as particular pollinators, but they do go to lots of other flowers for which they're not exclusively the pollinator, as we'll see in a minute. So I, when I was looking at these 4,000 photographs when I was locked up, um, I was particularly keen to see any examples of flowers where the morphology was such that it clearly was tuned to butterflies. And one of the few I found in the Australian flora was that example on the right-hand side there, which is uh, one of the Campanulaceae, related to bluebells. And um, that draws the butterfly's head right into the flower. And it has a, um, a sensitive mechanism that, that hits the head of the butterfly between the antennae and deposits pollen on its face. Um, and I, I don't know any bees or any flies that visit that flower. So that, that may be one of the few truly psychophilous Australian flowers. Um, amazing what you find when you're bored. Um, <clears throat> other sorts of morphology that suit butterflies, what, what are called brush flowers. So this would, eucalyptus would be an example of a brush flower. So lots of, lots of um, stamens and anthers um, based on concentric circles with, the, with a shallow dish and the nectar is at the bottom of the dish and so it fills that with nectar and you've got the style in the centre. So as the butterfly approaches, it gets brushed with nectar from these, um, these, these brush flowers. So it's a fairly untidy process, but butterflies are quite hairy and scaly, and so a degree of pollen does stick to them. And uh, then they go to the next flower and, and transfer it. But that, of course, doesn't exclude bees and flies and lots of other creatures, so those flowers are not exclusively butterfly visited. Another form is what they, what they call platform flowers. So if you look at the Asteraceae, which are the daisies, the daisies are the, the most successful family of plants after orchids. So orchids have, I think, 30,000 species globally, and daisies are not much less. But the secret to daisy success is the fact that um, the flower heads are actually compounds of lots of tiny flowers. So that, that central part of the flower is probably, in that picture there, it's probably got 100 tiny flowers that are individual. And around the showy part around it, which are called the ray florets, they're, they're actually sterile, but they contribute colour and shape and attract the insects from a distance. But once the insect lands on the central part, then pollen can be transferred. And daisies have what's called secondary transfer of pollen. So as the flower matures, um, the part with the anthers elongates and, and um, splits and presents the pollen. And so as the butterfly lands on it, it, again, the pollen's transferred to its underside. And so you sometimes see butterflies with a lot of yellow pollen on them. And the pollen's quite sticky as well. It's, um, it, it does stick quite well to insects. 
but again, not exclusively just to butterflies. You know, bees, flies all get a share of the reward. But each of those tiny flowers has a nectary at the bottom. So that if you watch the butterfly, it'll probe every flower very quickly with its proboscis and, and quite efficiently. So the question then is, can we say anything about what flowers might be preferred by Australian butterflies? And um, so hence um, the photographic evidence, because as you know, there's a vast number of photographs now put up on the web by amateur photographers, and you can ask interesting questions of this data set, and increasingly so as more photos go up. Ar arguably, it's uh, not a well-designed experiment because you've got no control over who photographs what, but you could argue that it's, it lacks biases which is an important thing. So you could argue that it's a, it's a reasonable cross-section of what's out there. At least that's what I would argue. <laughs> um, so I examined these images for evidence. So I had to have a butterfly landed on a flower, and I had to be convinced that it was actually feeding, not just sitting on the flower, because sometimes they rest or they defend territory or something. So you had to see the proboscis unrolled or some other evidence. So that got rid of about half the photo straight away. And I didn't... I rejected any photographs of butterflies on introduced plants, so garden plants, weed, most weeds, but certainly garden plants. That took out about another half of the photos. So you're getting down to about a thousand pictures that are useful. So that for each picture, I identified the butterfly, the plant, the location, the dates, and then the shape of the flower. So I'm still working through this data at the moment. But, um, and then let's see what we can conclude from what we see. So I decided, well, I'll just do southern Australian butterflies because I don't know much about tropical butterflies and certainly not about tropical plants. So I just drew a line across Alice Springs. I thought, well, I'll just look at butterflies south of the line. So that, that's fine. So that covers about four different um, rainfall zones in Australia. So it leaves out the summer rain dominant tropics, except for a bit around southeast Queensland. And um, amongst the many butterflies, well, <clears throat> that's a pool of 200 butterflies, and I had photographs for about 100 uh, species. Just out of interest, the one with the most records, unsurprisingly, and with the most different native plants or flowers that it visited was, was the Painted Lady. So that had 90-something, 93 or 98 species of uh, flowers. And I'm sure there's more being put up this spring if you look at the data. But what's interesting was that um, out of about 70, 75 families of plants that had butterflies visiting their flowers, um, only um, a handful of flower, uh, flower families were, were, were very important. So I looked at the, the five main groups of butterflies, you know, the swallowtails and the browns and the skippers, and um, I tallied up the number of photographs that um, for each plant family that had butterflies, and I just ranked them one to six. So you can see that um, out of um, the, the, the dozen families there of plants that are important, only two families, the, the daisies, the asteraceae, and the myrtaceae, which are the tea trees and those sorts of things, only those two families were important, were in the top six for all the butterfly groups, and all the rest are mixed up. So there's some evidence there then of, you know, um, tuning to particular plant families for certain butterfly groups um, broadly. So out of, as I say, 75 or so families, only a dozen are really important, uh, it would appear. What's <clears throat> the other thing that was quite striking that struck me was that um, if you look at the butterfly fauna of North America or Europe, um, very many of the butterfly species feed on as larvae, as caterpillars, and as adult butterflies on the same plant. So the plant leaves feed the caterpillar and the flowers of the same plant feed the butterfly. That almost never happens in Australia. It's, it's very, particularly in the southern Australian butterfly fauna, I don't know about the tropics, but there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that a lot of butterflies in southern Australia feed on grasses or sedges or um, those, sorts of, you know, those sorts of plants, monocots, and so they don't have nectar in the flowers, so that immediately takes them out of the question. Um, some of the important nectar sources like, um, like um, Santhereas, you know, black boys, those sorts of things, they uh, 
have very productive flowers, but no butterflies eat the leaves. And stunningly enough, um, eucalyptus, which is super abundant in Australia and feeds butterflies and lots of other insects from the flowers, virtually no butterflies eat the leaves. Lots of moths do, but almost no butterflies eat eucalyptus leaves, probably because they're quite poisonous. And one group of common plants that feeds lots of caterpillars of butterflies is, is acacia, wattles. So lots of butterflies feed on wattle foliage, but the beautiful yellow flowers of wattles have no nectar. They're, they're nectar free. So insects and bees that go to wattle flowers are, are gathering pollen. The, the pollen's edible and it's, has some oils and things like that, but there's no, no nectar. Um, acacias have what are called extra floral nectaries. So on the, at the base of the leaves, you'll see a little gland that secretes a little bit of sugary solution, but that's completely dominated by ants. So any other creature, like a butterfly that tries to tap into that, will get attacked by ants immediately because the ants defend that food source um, against all comers. Australia's got 3,000 species of ants, many of which are very aggressive. So if you want to be an insect in Australia, you've got to make your peace with ants in some way. And insects do this in some various ways. They either, they either become nocturnal when there's not many ants about, or they, they chemically interact with ants and subdue them. They, they raise chemicals that um, keep the ants calm, or even might, they might resemble an ant, or at least the scent of an ant, uh, and something like that. So, yes, a ants are probably one of the dominant land animals in Australia, more so than marsupials or other things like that. Um, so as I mentioned before, this idea that maybe butterflies are nectar robbers rather than um, anything more, uh, uh, more um, salubrious um, remains um, unresolved. But you can see, if you look at some of the photographs, you'll see butterflies probing into the nectaries but completely avoiding the reproductive parts of the flower. So they're not making contact with the style, with the female style or the male anthers at all. So they're making off with the nectar. Um, there's lastness. The red flowers are interesting because usually red in plants is directed at either at certain specialised bees or birds. So birds see into the red end of the spectrum, so honey eaters, hummingbirds, all those sorts of creatures. Um, again, if you go to Europe, there's no plants in Europe that are pollinated by birds. It's very odd. There, there is in Southern Africa and there is in Australia. Um, in the southwest corner of this, this Australia, nearly 20% of the plants are bird pollinated. So there's a lot of red flowers in southwestern Australia. And the group that are red coloured in South Australia and elsewhere, of course, are the mistletoes, which are bird pollinated, but also visited by butterflies that steal the nectar and sit at the base of the flower. The petals split to the base where the nectar is, and then the butterflies can reach in and, and take the nectar. And these plants have a lot of nectar. They, they pump up nectar overnight so they're at their maximum at dawn for the birds as they come around. And then the nectar, of course the birds don't take all the nectar, there's enough there for butterflies to enjoy. And in the heat of the day, the nectar concentrates until it's you know, quite viscous and only a few butterflies can actually suck it up. It's, it's like honey, literally the consistency of honey. Now interestingly, the, these Agaras butterflies actually do use mistletoes for the larvae. So it's one of the few examples of where of an Australian butterfly where the butterfly uses both the nectar and the leaves as, as a food source at different stages of its life cycle. So we just looked at a couple of the butterfly groups, so the, the swallowtails in rank order. Most of the records are at white flowers, then red, then yellow, then blue. Um, over the entire southern Australian butterfly fauna, um, half of all the records were at white flowers. And that's probably not because they choose white, it's because white's the most common colour in the flora of southern Australia. Um, in fact, uh, it's, it's twice as common as yellow, which is the next most common colour. But you can see um, the large swallowtail, they're going to, um, to Bradford Kyneton. Um, in, this, in the bottom right there, that's Maclay's swallowtail, which likes white and yellow. This uh, bottom left one here, the Papilio anactus, which is the common butterfly in the suburbs of Adelaide. Um, I found very few records at native flowers. It goes to lots of introduced garden flowers, but very few native flowers. At least it's not photographed at native flowers, I should say. It's, it's quite a hard butterfly to approach to. It's very flighty and 
to get close enough to photograph it's not not easy but it's also an example of a butterfly that's probably doing quite well because of human settlements because it feeds on citrus as a caterpillar and takes lots of garden flowers as a nectar source in, in appearance um, the order is white yellow red so uh, the first picture there is Delius Havelisi on Stackhousia. Now Stackhousia is something of a butterfly flower in the sense that it has a long tube that suits the proboscis. It also has a strong fragrance, but it's also visited at night time by moths. Um, take the nectar, but butterflies during the daytime. And I've never seen native bees on it, so it might be a Lepidoptera specialist. And then yellow flowers like Senecio and Callistamon and what have you. So Pyarids are one of the butterfly groups that see into the red end of the spectrum quite well, along with the swallowtails. In the Hesperids, these are the most primitive butterfly group. These pretty much are white and yellow and occasionally other colours, but mainly white and yellow. And these go to dandelions, for example. Dandelions are very important for skippers. In fact, if you want to collect skippers, you, you can't ignore dandelion flowers if you want to observe them. Um, and on the right-hand side there, I've just got a, a count of the actual records I could find for the different colours, and you can see how, um, you know, white's um, quite outstanding there. In the Lycaenids, the Lycaenids take a big range of colours, um, including blue, so Cantalides there on uh, one of the blue lobelias. So lobelias are quite interesting because they have that bilateral symmetry. They don't have radial symmetry like most flowers, so they, they're quite conspicuous to insects. Um, and that hippocrysops on, on weights here. And um, so lysenids are, again, hard to photograph. They're very flighty, hard to approach, and easily overlooked. But um, there are a few people who photograph them regularly who, as a specialty, which is, which is good. Um, but butterflies also take nutrients elsewhere. So nectar is not that nutritious necessarily. It's full of energy and has a few amino acids and water. But um, if you need nitrogen to produce eggs or more eggs, then you need to widen out your food supply. So some butterflies will take exudates. So uh, this can be honeydew from sap-sucky insects, um, from a lerp uh, there, from, um, in one case here, a um, a bird dropping. It's a common brown female feeding at a bird dropping. So I can only find one photograph of that out of thousands. But uh, it's a rare event, but it happens. So butterflies are alert to other opportunities for food in their environment. Um, and tree sap. So Polyura, the, um, the four-tailed butterfly, which is now present in South Australia, um, there were no records on flowers at all. But it does take tree sap. So if there's been a puncture wound in the tree or a, a borer has bitten into the trunk and it bleeds sap, these butterflies will turn up and start drinking the sap, which is quite sugary in many cases. But, um, but I was surprised to see it totally absent from flowers, apparently. And then there's other feeding behaviour. There's uh, what's called puddling. This is typically seen in the tropics, in, in the hot tropics, where Butterflies need supplementary water, uh, but uh, it occurs in southern Australia too in the summertime, so um, almost all the swallowtails uh, take water, so they'll go to creek margins um, and, and suck up water from uh, wet gravel, um, the, the lesser wanderer. Um, even small lysenids will take water uh, if necessary. So it probably happens more than people appreciate this behaviour. I must say I've never seen it in life myself in Lycenas until I found it in these photographs. So it certainly uh, does occur there. And then I've got a few, just a few pictures here of some of the main uh, plant groups that the butterflies go to. So um, the Brogenaceae, the one they most commonly go to is uh, this interesting species here called Cattlebush, um, Flicodesma, which occurs in the central part of Australia, but it goes all the way to Africa. In fact, we probably came from Africa the other way, actually, into Australia sometime in the tertiary in the last few tens of millions of years. And um, if you look at its colour and disposition and shape, you would assume it's bee-pollinated. And in fact, it is. 
large bees go to this plant, but also butterflies do as well, it turns out. So I think I had a record of four species of butterflies going to cattle bush. And it flowers in the winter in central Australia as well, so it's one of the few nectar sources at that time of year. Because Borygenaceae is the same family as Salvation Jane, which not many butterflies use at all, despite the fact it's got lots of nectar. It might be poisonous. And then Pamelia. This is an interesting group. There's a lot of Pamelias in southern Australia, and they are heavily visited by, by butterflies, particularly skippers. They've got that nice tubular form, which suits butterflies. And they have just two anthers that stick out, and the, the pollen is bright orange and very sticky. Um, and they're, they're, they're very fragrant as well. It's in the same family as, um, oh, what's that garden plant, that very fragrant garden plant from Africa? Anyway, that one. Um, so there's not many plants in the Thymeliaceae in the world, but the few that are known f um, for their pollination are, are butterfly pollinated. So it's, a, it's, it's an, obviously an ancient association that's being conserved. Uh, Salastraceae, this is a, a weird little tropical family, but Stackhouse, it comes into southern Australia. And um, it forms stands, like on the left-hand side there. You can find, you know, sometimes um, a couple of hundred square metres. It, it, it has underground runners and throws up little individual plants, and they all flower at the same time. And, and as I say, very fragrant, particularly in the evenings when they start to bring moths in. But they clearly attract beetles and other creatures as well. Um, now the Myrtaceae, this is one of the families which was important for all five butterfly families. Um, but you get this enormous difference in the flower morphology. So you, you, you get the brush flowers in eucalyptus, you get this sort of uh, tubular brush combination in calytrix. So you've got a tubular flower with a nectary at the bottom, but the anthers of its stamens are multiplied to give you a brush flower at the top. So it's sort of got all bases covered and it is very attractive to butterflies. In fact, down at Hallow Cove the other day, I saw them attracting butterflies, um, although it's late in the season for it. Um, in fact, that Tantopodia, that butterfly there, that's uh, one of the skippers that's strongly attracted to it on the, on the coast of Adelaide. And then Leptospermum tea trees have an open bowl-shaped flower, uh, which is very accessible. In the Pittosporaceae, um, You've got Berseria, which is in the Adelaide Hills, very common. It's a prickly plant. Um, farmers don't like it because it, the prickles get into sheep's wool. But it's a very persistent plant, long-lived, tolerates drought, um, quite pretty. It's got a nice smell. Uh, butterflies love it, and so does every other insect flying past. So it's always humming with creatures, including honey, honeybees. In fact, you can buy a special, um, they call it, well, in Tasmania it's called um, boxthorn honey. You pay a premium for it. Um, also in the same family, the Pittosporaceae is, is true Pittosporum, so we have some native Pittosporums in South Australia. Um, there's one that goes into the semi-arid zone that's an important butterfly flower. I found repeated pictures of butterflies at that one. Um, the lower left there, that's um, Pseudomenus that occurs on the east coast of Australia, not, not as far west as here, but that feeds on one of the uh, rainforest um, Pittosporums. And then this one here, this is, of course, a Xantheria. This has been kicked around different plant families for many years, including it used to be in the Xantheraceae, but that's now being sunk into Asphodelaceae, which is a, mostly a southern hemisphere genus, but it's big in Africa. Um, but um, it's a very unusual plant because it can live for hundreds of years. It's almost impossible to kill it. You can burn it every two or three years and it just bounces back repeatedly. Um, but it has been overcleared, of course, from farmland. And you can see in that left-hand picture there, that's just a year after a fire. So it's obvious the first green thing that rebounds, that adds green biomass back to the landscape, is uh, xanthoreas. And they, they'll flower within 12 months. OK, so they've got stored energy underground. And, if, uh, and, and that nectar supply is very important for bringing insects back into those burned forests. Uh, you can see it's, it's, it's a widespread genus, and it even is in central Australia as well. Uh, I think there's about 30 species across Australia in, in the group. And um, this notion you sometimes read about called a nectar bridge, so that many butterflies um, require an energy top-up as they move around the landscape. And so Xanthoria is one of those plants that provides nectar over many square kilometres, so butterflies can move from 
forest patch to forest patch by just refueling at these, uh, these nectar sources. It has a very copious but very dilute nectar. Um, beekeepers don't like it. They try and keep their bees away from it because the amount of water in the nectar is much higher than average, but it's very easy to drink up by butterflies if you've got a, a straw. And it's often regarded as a bonanza resource, so wherever it occurs, it attracts butterflies in the tropics and everywhere else. So if you're a butterfly collector, you want to camp out near the flaring santherias and the butterflies come to you. In fact, I've seen birds pick them off. Um, I've seen honey eaters, which you, you might imagine are there to get the nectar. They're actually there to get the butterflies, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll grab the butterflies as they come in. It's a, a cheap meal. Uh, Scrofulariaceae includes uh, the myoporums, which are important on the coast. You, you wouldn't presume that's a butterfly flower because it's very rather small and white and inconspicuous and got radial symmetry. It's, it's got what they call bee guides, those little spots guide bees to the nectary. But in fact, I found a lot of photographs of butterflies at myoporum, which I, I didn't expect. It's a widespread genus too um, in southern Australia. And then naturalised weeds. I was talking to Jerry before about the ambivalent status of weeds in Australia now because you know, weeds are here to stay in this vast numbers, but they're not all necessarily bad. Um, many native insects, including butterflies, are very happily adapted to weeds as a nectar source. And in fact, if you took these weeds out of the environment, you'd probably deplete the butterfly population as well in certain circumstances. Um, this plant's scabiosa which is now very, I see it all over South Australia now, but 40 years ago, it was uncommon. It, it might be a garden escape, I'm not sure. It's, it's from Mediterranean Europe, and, and it's regarded as a very good butterfly nectar source in Europe. But um, yes, again, from the photographic evidence, lots of native butterflies are going to scabiosa, and it's common on roadsides, farmland. So on average, you probably wouldn't want to get rid of it, because it's not necessarily displacing native plants in, in many places. But everything from swallowtail butterflies to, to skippers um, enjoy scabiosa. Um, the second most common nectar flower I found was blackberries. Lots of native butterflies go to, go to blackberry flowers, um, particularly in the eastern states, but here too. So again, you know, should you leave some blackberries in the environment? Possibly. In Queensland, lantana, which is a notorious and declared weed, is, is um, heavily visited by native butterflies which are known to not only feed on it, but to actually improve its seed set. So they're actually actively pollinating the lantana and they know experimentally that you get more seeds. So we need to kill more butterflies to get rid of lantana, I guess. Um, so just my last picture here really is just to get people to think about conserving nectar resources. So as I say, we're focused on conserving food plants, but perhaps less so on nectar sources. And often we don't have good information about what particular nectar sources we might want to uh, preserve. So as I'm working through this data, I'm getting an idea that, you know, this, a preferred subset of flowers that can be recommended as, um, uh, for planting. So there's a challenge there to restore these nectar plants into the environment. This is, as I say, this open question about the value of weeds in certain places. Um, and also, I'd encourage more people to photograph butterflies at flowers. Um, it's, uh, as I say, it's good hard evidence of an interaction. Um, and for half the butterfly fauna of southern Australia, I could find no records at all, no photographic records of all, at all. So only 100 of the 200 species of southern Australian butterflies have a record, a, 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 a nectar record. Uh, so there's a skipper there on, on um, blackberry and um, Cape weed feeds butterflies as well. And just lastly, a few sort of things that need to change. If you go to Western Australia, the nurseries will sell you these rather nice uh, xanthoreas which have been dug out of the bush um, as they're expanding the suburbs north and south. Um, the developers are salvaging these plants and selling them in the nurseries for so many dollars a half metre or something. And they're very architectural plants, you see, rather nice plantings of these outside people's houses in Perth. But sadly, they're probably 200 years old. They're not being replaced at the same rate they're being, being cut down. Um, 
And so the challenge for the future then is to restore the nectar-rich habitat. So one interesting thing to do is to go back to the old literature from the 1840s, 1850s, when Adelaide was rapidly expanding. And people often mention in passing, you know, what native plants were there and the fact that some of them are disappearing, you know, as sheep numbers increase or cattle numbers. And so things like, uh, like Lotus Australis, which was very common in the Adelaide Plains, are now very rare. It's, it's only the sand dunes on the coast now. There was a, a plant called Cullen, which uh, used to be called Cerealia, which is the food plant for the lovely yellow-spotted swallowtail that's almost extinct on the Adelaide Plains now, just about. But it could be restored, you would imagine. Um, and so we could probably strategically bring some of these plants back into you know, roadsides, alongside railway lines, um, vacant lots, of which there are not many. Um, perhaps the, uh, uh, the submarine project, if they've never built it, they could plant that out with native plants. And that's the end. <laughs> okay, so Peter's going to take some questions now. Um, what we'll try and do is repeat the question so for the uh, audience at home. So, who would like to go first? Okay, thanks, Linda. Is there a website or a link that you'd like photographs to see of wildlife on trails? Are you collecting yep. them? So, um, Linda's just asked um, where should photos be sent for Peter to uh, add to his library? So, I've just been sort of scouring lots of different sites. But, but it's a good question. I mean, th there would be value in having, for example, a folder on perhaps iNaturalist that was called Butterflies on Flowers. Um, there's a lot of butterfly interest groups that, um, that uh, take photographs more widely, not just on flowers. So, but it's a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll look at getting up a, a folder on iNaturalist and because people sometimes duplicate the same picture in different folders for different purposes. So. Yeah, no, that would be a good idea. Yep. Absolutely. If you've got like thousands right now, you send them on a Dropbox through Jan to me. And <laughs> but um, but I, I am aware that there must be many photos out there that are, that are not sort of in the public domain that are sitting on people's hard drives or in their cameras that would be wonderful to, to see. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, John. Okay, to paraphrase that, John's asking why is the lesser wanderer uh, rarer in Adelaide? Well, I think broadly it's, it's at the limits of its climatic tolerance, I would say. But it's an interesting species because it, uh, it's part of a super species of about four, four or five species that start in Africa and go right across the southern part of Asia into Australia. And um, about 15 years ago, the Australian species which was thought to be the same as the Asian species was separated out as a different species. It's got slightly different morphological differences. But um, the food plant for its larvae, uh, this, you know, the milkweed family, those with the white sap, the Apicinaceae, which are poisonous plants. And there's, that's really a tropical group of plants um, in both hemispheres. And um, the ones in Australia are, are very diverse. are very diverse in tropical Australia. Only a handful come into the into South Australia and into the interior. But there's four or five species of this group come in around Alice Springs, for example. Um, there's one Marsdini, I think it's called. The, is it the native banana? It's, a, it's an indigenous food source, so that that supports the larvae, and that I think comes into the Flinders Ranges possibly. So it does breed reasonably reliably into the the northern Flinders. But then beyond that, it's what you call an, an eruptive species, which tends to have outbreaks that f come south. So in about one year in 10, you'll see a lot of them about. But they may well have bred 500 kilometres to the north or more even. And they do, as the name suggests, wanderers. They do, they do move around looking for food supplies, whether it's larval food or nectar. And that, 
Remember that blue flower, the Brajanaceae, uh, the cattle bush? That, that's very attractive to lesser wanderers, partly because it flowers in winter when they're often dispersing from central Australia. They, they hatch from the pupa, often in June, July, and, and start to make their way south for hundreds of kilometres. And they use that plant as a, as a nectar bridge because it's one of the few flowering plants in the wintertime. Um, but... Um, but they're a bit like caper whites. Caper whites are somewhat similar. They're really a tropical group. Again, caper whites. There's African caper whites and Asian caper whites and Australian caper whites. And they, they have these big boom bus cycles that probably follow the El Nino years when there's lots of food, green food plant for the larvae. They breed like crazy and the butterflies start dispersing. But they're not truly migratory because they don't return. Like wanderers in North America go down to Mexico and return and you get this true migratory cycle. The ones in Australia have these eruptions where they have boom years and they all move to the coast, mainly because they've probably eaten all the food plant in the centre and they're looking for fresh food plants. So you, they'll strip all the caparous plants in the botanic gardens about once a decade, for example. And I've seen them, I've seen them washed up on the south coast of Kangaroo Island where they've overshot <laughs> and gone out to sea, exhausted, and then dragged in on the tide. So you get a high tide mark of caper white butterflies. Um, which is just their fate. In fact, uh, painted ladies turn up on Macquarie Island, which is latitude 55, halfway to Antarctica, about every second or third year. There's one or two painted ladies turn up on Macquarie Island. There's no food plant, so they're doomed, but they're... <laughs> yeah. OK, Anne. No, no. Presumably, they leave this area. Yes, very likely. Yep. Why aren't they taking their nectar from the citrus? Yes, yes. Citrus nectar is quite. Oh. So with the question was about the painted lady. Where does it get dainty the dainty swallowtail? Sorry, Anne. Uh, where does it get its food from? Uh, I think part of the reason might be that citrus nectar is um, quite oily. It, it, it's rich in um, terpenes and things that you know give lemons and citrus their flavour. So some nectars are unattractive to butterflies for that reason. But on the other hand, there might be butterflies that do like it because they're co-adapted to it. But um, the dainty swallowtail is a species that doesn't appear in the early literature for, for, for South Australia. So it turned up sometime in the late 19th century, early 20th, when citrus was being put into gardens. So it's obviously quite a dispersive species. You can find citrus over long distances. And then if there's a critical mass of citrus, then they'll establish permanent populations. But uh, it did strike me from the photographs that I think more than three quarters of the photographs of the flowers were at garden flowers, which is interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the dainty swallowtail, if you ever go to wetlands, we have um, dainty swallowtails scraping out the territory. Oh, yes, yes. Like the yes, the males. No so no. are they in fact strolling to wetlands? They could, could well be. They could well be. Th th there'd be some resource there. Um, there are some butterflies that form what they're called leks, uh, L-E-Ks, where males will defend a territory where they expect a female to turn up at some time. It's sort of a very hopeful strategy, like teenage <laughs> boys or something, I don't know, but, they, but these leks are known. They're more a tropical thing where butterflies will find a sunspot on a large tree that's well lit and that attracts females eventually. But I, I'm not, I don't know that well, that would be the case with that species, but it could be. It, it's for such a conspicuous butterfly, it's not very well studied. In fact, there's a lot of conspicuous butterflies that are not well, not well studied at all. Yeah. Um, in uh, the habitat for the checker, uh, for the checker copper, Lucia limbaria, we see that same territorial staking out yep. um, by the males, just four or five metres. Yes. Uh, yes. It's, it's how common is that to yep. Yep. other species? Well, I think sometimes females use it as a surrogate for the, you know, the um, the value of the male. So if you've got a, you know a strong, powerful male that can f fight off other males, then this is sort of a demonstration that that he's of high quality, and so the female will eventually, you know, choose him. But uh, yeah, poor old males, you know, have a bit of a hard life. They <laughs> but um, you do see a lot of competition. And so from a male butterfly's point of view, a, you know, a, a female is an important resource. And so uh, but, but what, what's interesting, I'd studied a, a rare butterfly in Tasmania called the Tanara Brown, and I was amazed to find that um, the females only mate once. So a lot of tropical butterflies mate multiple times. And there's, in fact, things like sperm competition and all sorts of things. And 
you, you get the shouldered brown in the far southeast of South Australia, but it's a common species in the eastern states. And when that mates with a male, the male releases a, a glue that actually clags up the genital tract of the female, so it can't mate again. Um, it's a bit cruel, really. But, uh, but, but um, this rare Tanara brown only mated once. And the interesting thing is the males patrol, the males hatch first from the pupa a few days, and they form little territories that they patrol and fight off other males in the expectation that within their territory a female will emerge a few days later. And when she does, and she opens her wings, they're quite different looking. The males are dark and the females are bright orange. Um, she's mated within minutes. She, she's usually mated before the wings are dry. And um, what she does then is she goes and finds a flower to feed, often a dandelion, um, on the roadside. And um, once she's mated, she's not interested in males. And so she often folds her wings and, and they're very um, cryptic on the underside. So she's almost impossible to see. So you get these interesting small-scale behaviours going on. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for another question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, why is the cabbage white butterfly so dominant? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the great success story in butterflies, actually. It's, it's possibly the most common large butterfly in the world, I, I would imagine. And um, the reason it's not many birds eat it is because it's quite poisonous. Um, in fact, the white colour um, is, is probably what they call aposematic. It's probably an, an advertisement to birds that it is toxic. So we, we tend to think of you know red and stripes as a danger sign, but... Uh, but, but pure white butterflies are usually toxic. And of course, it's feeding on a widespread plant, you know, brassicas, which are both weeds and crops. So there's plenty of food plant for the larvae. And, and they're very long-lived butterfly. They, they can live for some months. And, and they are very motivated feeders. They'll, they'll take nectar from many, many plants. I, unfortunately, I rejected them for this little study, but I, I regret it a bit now. I wish I'd perhaps gathered up you know, evidence of different flowers, but my impression was, as I rejected them, was that they're on a, a big variety of flowers, including native flowers, I might add, but also garden ones. You see, it only turned up in Australia in the 1940s, but from the first record around 1940, it was a great rarity, but within five years it was everywhere, and people stopped reporting it because it was, uh, it was universal. And, and in Europe, it's migratory. Well, it's both migratory and dispersive, so some populations migrate and come back and others just go one way and um, it's in northern Canada now it, it's, it's very tolerant to a wide range of climates as well um, and it breeds continuously so it doesn't have a spring generation and an autumn generation it just if it's warm enough it'll breed non-stop and so you get clouds of them sometimes yeah but uh, uh, last question Mike uh, yeah So in Europe, there seems to be some predation of the cabbage white butterfly. Um, are there any predators here? Yeah. So th there have been parasites introduced from Europe, like a pantalus, um, but not the variety that occur there. Um, I mean, they take out a few butterflies, but 5% possibly, something like that, I suspect. Um, but um, but the, the large white, which looks just like it, but it's bigger, has been introduced now to New Zealand. In, in recent years, and it, it's, it'll likely get to Australia because the small white came to us from New Zealand in, in around 1940. So it was in New Zealand, I think, in 1937, and then within three years, it turned up in uh, New South Wales. Yeah. I take it this is an accidental... Probably, or carelessness. I mean, there's so much trade now, and, you know, containerized trade, that everything gets everywhere. Um, I mean, containers, you know, they often get dumped in paddocks near ports for weeks or months at a time, so every creature known to man climbs underneath like snails and hitches a ride 
quarantines really, you know, largely theatrical these days, like security. I mean, they can look at a few containers, but, you know, there's tens of thousands of containers coming to the country every day. I mean, you can't sterilise or check them all. So, basically, there's a, there's a globalisation of insects like there is of everything else in the world. And, in fact, qu because quarantine is expensive and, 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 you know, traders don't like it because it delays things and costs money, th there is a body of opinion that says, well, let's abandon quarantine altogether. Let, let, let's manage the pests as they emerge because we've got technologies and things like this. Or you simply, you know, if you butterflies eat all the cabbages, well, let's eat something else in our diet, you know, but we're not going to starve because we can't eat cabbages. Um, and so there is a push on to, a, you know, let's think about abandoning quarantine altogether. Um, same in drug laws. I mean, you know, we abandon drug laws for certain drugs and are we any worse off? Who knows? All right, look, thank you very much. We must um, finish there, but I'd certainly like to extend our grateful thanks to Peter for a wonderful talk, and I'd like you to acknowledge him in the usual way. So thank you very much for being part of this, um, our 11th year of public talks, um, which we... Um, I fondly bring fabulous information to the wider community. It's our f one and main feature of the Butterfly Conservation SA is to actually encourage people to conserve and manage our Lepidoptera. And um, we're really uh, enjoying, we're a very strong organisation, so if you're not a member, we encourage you to join. Um, and we are busy planning next year's program at the moment. So um, we look forward to seeing you at many more talks. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being part of this special event. And we thank the museum and the staff, um, particularly the catering staff and the AV staff for their help um, in putting this on. So thank you very much and safe travels home. <laughs>